Famcast Media. Bitch. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, persons of all ages, welcome to the most exclusive group in the wrestling community. And now, our host, Bertrand. Como estamos, mi gente? Here we are for a live edition and my review of AEW All Out. First things first, let's get this shit out the way. This show was better than the one we got last week. All Out is by far the best AEW show we've gotten in years. It eclipses Forbidden Door as well. But let's jump right into it, guys. How about it? Zero Hour gets started with the over-budget Battle Royal. And the first thing that comes to mind is, why is Adam Page in this match? I feel like I'm on an island all by myself when I sit here and I say to myself, Hey, self, why is Adam Page not being used properly? Why is Adam Page being scrubbed out to the pre-show? I really have no idea what the thought process is. But anyway, he comes out with the win because, honestly, there was no other option. So he gets the win. He gets the prize for his charity of his choosing. Right from there, we go to the trio's women match. And this match is pretty solid for uh, a zero-hour match, I thought. We have Athena, Mercedes, and Diamante versus Sky Blue and Willow Nightingale. Oh, and Sheeta. The match is pretty basic. It's about 10 minutes, and, you know, they do their stuff, but they didn't get enough time. I feel like for a trios match, 10 minutes is not enough. We need more time for the women wrestlers. I don't know what's going on uh, in the E and this company, but honestly, I feel like the women just kind of get side bumped for it. Like, it's like, you know what? You're going to be the Zach Gowan of the night. Check out that reference. It's a good one. Anyway. The final match of Zero Hour is the Acclaimed versus Jeff Jarrett's crew. We got Jeff Jarrett, a 6-3 Jay Lethal. KK, listen, I've stood right next to that man in a professional wrestling ring. I can promise you he's not 6-3. I am 5'10". We are the same height. Okay, just letting you guys know. Jeff Jarrett and Singh. This match itself, it was super fast. It was, it, it was what it was. This match was designed specifically to get to the main event. That's what we did here. All we did was let's put the acclaim out there, pop the crowd real quick, and just get it rocking so we can get the actual show started. And of course, we get the show started with the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championships. We have MJF and Adam Cole versus Dark Order. Now, I feel like Dark Order has kind of been relegated to be like this Enhancement talent, but listen, enhancement talent don't get pay per view matches, so don't get me wrong. These cats are pretty good, but obviously, it's all about MJF and Adam Cole. That's what I got out of this match. The match itself was okay, but it was all about furthering the story with the best friends and furthering the neck injury for MJF. I think it's a way to keep him super strong. So, if Adam Cole decide, like, if that's the guy that they decide is gonna dethrone MJF as the AEW world's champ, I think they're going to play up the neck injury a lot to progress the story, to keep it going. You also got to remember that both of Adam Cole's finishers are above the shoulder moves. He's got the Shining Wizard and he's got the Canadian Destroyer. So, I mean, I think that's telling in itself. But listen, guys, I got to stop here. Before I move on to the next match, I got to say, a couple of weeks ago, uh, anti-wrestling fan on TikTok was talking to fans about – was talking to other wrestling creators about how long-term storytelling and an old program are not the same thing. 
And she was very clear, and she goes into it telling them, like, hey, two guys getting a photo backstage and then them working each other 10 years later. That's not a long-term story. And I very politely stitched in and told her, I agree with everything you're saying. It was perfect. I'm not disagreeing with you. Great point. But how amazing would it be if we got a callback to MJF and Samoa Joe? Because if we do, it would make sense because Samoa Joe shoved MJF. And then during an entrance, MJF did the same shit. Well, tonight we got that, guys. As Samoa Joe comes down to the ring, he shoves MJF in the same way he did NXT. But this time he gives him a little shit-eating smirk. I thought that was such an exceptional way to like pay nod to something in the past. And of course, MJF bum rushes the ring and they have a little, um, you know, barn burner or whatever. And then they need to be separated. I thought, you know what? This is great because what if we get Samoa Joe versus MJF? Those promos are going to be fire as fuck. But we're going to move on to Samoa Joe versus Shane. The match starts off hot and heavy. I mean, this is like as I was, I'm in a discord group and these guys were just saying it. So I'm going to say it on here. It was meat slapping meat. Let me tell you something. This was hard hitting after Rhea and Raquel last night. And then this match, I'm telling you, big people in professional wrestling, they're getting their due. This was a, a really physical battle. Not as physical as a match we're going to talk about a little later. But honestly, I thought this was really good. My favorite spot was definitely Samoa Joe putting the Coquina clutch on Shane only for him to walk forward and give him a hanging stunner. Guys, that's pretty unique right there. A hanging stunner? We've seen a lot of things, but I, I can't tell you the last time I saw something like that. I really enjoyed the match. I liked how Joe really just beat the snot out of him. I think it helped elevate Shane as well because it, it, it's slowly going to like familiarize him with a lot of the fans in AEW that don't watch Ring of Honor. I like, I like when they do stuff like this. Let's put those Ring of Honor titles on AEW PLEs so that way people can, you know, get used to those workers down there. Let's use Ring of Honor like an NXT. I don't really like saying that being that I grew up with Ring of Honor, but I understand that and I understand that that's how the business goes. Samoa Joe gets the win here with the Coquina Clutch. It's pretty solid. Uh, up next, we have Darby Allen versus Luchasaurus. They played Darby's back injury all match. I mean, he really got his ass kicked in this match. Uh, he, I don't know. I, I feel like, are we going backwards with Darby? Not because he's losing, but I, I really feel like this was the spot to have him win. Because if you have him win or you have Christian somehow cost him the match, like in, um, in like a conniving way. I think it helps elevate Darby, but I was really surprised that Darby didn't win this match, especially because Luchasaurus really doesn't win anything. Maybe it's just me, but next stop we have what I thought. <laughs> I felt like I kept saying this to myself, match of the night, match of the night, match of the night. That's how good it all out got, was, guys. So we have Powerhouse Hobbs versus Miro. This was tough, man. This was Yokozuna versus Vader. This was guys just nailing each other. Like, I'm sure you guys have heard stories about Earthquake and Big Boss Man just slapping the shit out of each other in the ring. That's what this felt like. I love this match. I feel like we're getting back to this style because we have either average-sized professional wrestlers or we have guys this size. We don't really have the big, beefy Wardlow guys. That's not really something we get anymore. It's either one or the other. Either you're going to be a super heavyweight or... Or you're going to be a regular size guy like an MJF and Adam Cole, Brian Danielson, or so on and so forth. All right, so this match is so hard hitting. Obviously, it is designed to specifically get Miro to that next spot. So after what happened yesterday, which I'll talk about here, CM Punk being let go, I'll give more thoughts at the end of this. I felt like Miro needed to be pushed in the right direction. I felt like Miro needed to keep getting some wins. I felt we needed him to further himself up the card. He's just been kind of relegated to all these different things, but he's not actually been put in a great spotlight. And I've said this a lot about Karrion Cross. If he had someone like Lana 
he would be over already because Scarlett's not really a great talker. It's been pointed out to me that she's really good in terms of comedy, but she's not a great like talker. She can't really put someone over. Lana can. And as soon as I said that shit yesterday, here we are today, and CJ Perry is in AEW. CJ Perry is elite. She is a part of this company now. She comes out to help her husband after Powerhouse Hobbs takes the loss not so well. She hits him with a chair, distracts him for Miro to hit him with two nice chair shots, one to the back and then one to the top of the head. And oh my God, guys, you got to stop with the head chair shots. We know too much already. Either that or Hobbs, put your hands up. I mean, this isn't 1985 where you just got to take that shit. This is an ECW in the early 2000s where it's a badge of honor. We need to be more respectful of the head. Let's try to do that next time. Um, But what I found out was so perplexing was that after this match, Miro wasn't really happy that his wife was there. Now, I don't know if they're going to play up this whole stupid angle that, you know, fragile men don't like when women come out and help them. But I'm just really hoping that we get a really good pop later on that we get them together and hopefully Miro wins the title. Maybe he's the guy that beats John Moxley, but we'll get to, we'll get to that. All right. Next up we have Ruby versus Chris Stratlander. Listen, I'm a fan of both of these women. This match was solid. It was not great. They were given ample time. So I felt, but what really stuck out to me was Tony storm. Just the addition of Tony Storm costing Ruby the match. The fact that we're furthering the character of like the Harley Quinn slash Marilyn Monroe kind of like, um, I'm ready for my close up, Mr. DeMille. Like that style, you know, go back and watch it. Mulholland, Mulholland, Mulholland Drive. Wow, I can't talk. I'm so excited. I'm sorry. But. I really enjoy Tony's character right now. I think she's got a good presentation. I think all in all, she's a great in-ring performer. And as my buddy Pat says all the time, this is what she's been missing. She's been missing this one thing. So I wouldn't be surprised if her contract runs out, if H gets on the phone and he's like, hey, come back here. We can make this work because we know. That her and Rhea Ripley can tear the house down. Her and Piper Niven can tear the house down. Her and Charlotte Flair can tear the house down. But uh, sticking to this company, obviously, you know, Chris retains the title. And the match itself, like I said, was was just okay. Now, I'm rocking my dude's shirt because I really thought this was going to be the match of the night. I didn't think it would get eclipsed. But I promise you it did. Brian Danielson versus Ricky Starks was a way to make a star. Let me say that again. Brian Danielson versus Ricky Starks was designed to make a star. Brian fed him so much heat. He beat the snot out of Brian Danielson. Ricky looked like a million bucks. The addition of Big Bill into the match and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat only told me that Ricky can't move as fluid and fast as he used to. So we're not going to get that WrestleMania versus Chris Jericho, Ricky the Dragon, okay? So if that's what you guys are expecting, there's a reason why Brian came back early from injury. Getting back to this match, I thought these strap hits were jarring. I mean, they were uncomfortable to watch. Brian is my favorite worker, and to watch him get hit in the face with a strap, I thought, wow, man, that's that's killer. Like we we gotta be a little bit calmer. Like I said, like Brian, out of all people, he knows what head injuries are like, but I I can't imagine you would catch a concussion from a a strap. But I felt like this match, what it did was it helped elevate Ricky Starks. We already know that his star is on the rise. But the finish of this match, guys, is what's going to stick out to everyone. Will this be his WrestleMania 13 moment? Will this be his bloody face not tapping to the sharpshooter? Because for him to get the label lock, refusing to tap, and then Brian pulling out something he's only done once before, which is use the foreign object for the label lock, just like he did 
against Randy Orton to catch a win. He's done it before, but he's only won one other time with this. He puts the strap around Ricky's neck twice, pulls him. Ricky holds his breath and gives you the best face, and he found that hard cam like that, guys. It was brilliant, to be honest with you. I thought this match itself, uh, uncomfortable is the best word to describe it, but, I mean, Brian Danielson, I- I'm, I'm going to make this a popular thing. I'm going to make a fucking t-shirt. I'm going to go out this weekend and buy myself a cricket just so I could make a t-shirt. Brian, Mr. Steel, the show, Danielson, because that's exactly what he did, guys. He stole the show for a small amount of time. All right, moving on from there, we have the tag match with Shibata and Eddie Kingston versus Wheeler and Claudio. This match was hard-hitting. It was pretty solid. It had a weird ending. I thought they did a really good job of not letting Eddie and Claudio near each other very much, but... What I found was good was that they actually ended with Eddie and Claudio. They didn't have a lot of offense towards each other. But I really love how, for years, guys, we have been talking up these European uppercuts by Cesaro, right? Then he goes over to AEW, and he decides to take his offense with him. He's doing the big swing. He's doing the elevated European uppercut. And he hits one of the loudest European uppercuts we've ever heard. So you know it was a solid shot. I mean, you absolutely knew that. And from there, he just catches a pin. And while everybody's confused, did he just beat Eddie Kingston with a European uppercut? Here goes Nigel McGinnis, selling it like a pro. I mean, Nigel... Nigel, he should seriously think about being a free agent and doing Raw SmackDown on AEW because this dude could be a millionaire by by like next week. He is that good of an announcer. The way he sells things, the way he ribs on people, and then brings it all the way back for to professional wrestling. I am in awe of what I'm watching with Nigel McGuinness. I believe what he says was, I have never seen a match end with a European uppercut. And immediately yelling into his microphone, Claudio is such such an incredible performer. I love it. So, now we're down to the final couple of matches, guys. I wanted to give a little more time on these because I really like these. Kenny Omega versus Takeshita, I thought, was the second match to make a superstar. Because Kenny loses clean. That's right. That's exactly what I said, guys. Kenny Omega lost this match clean. Now, as I said on TikTok, there was some theatricality, but ultimately, he lost clean. He went for the one-wing angel. He couldn't hit it. Takeshita hits him with a running knee, almost like a King Shasa, but with um, a 12-6 to knee instead of, like, you know, the 9-3. to And Kenny kicks out. Takeshita goes back to the corner. He pulls his knee brace down. He runs. And with his bare knee, he hits him with his running knee. And he just catches a pin. And the crowd is shocked. But I think it works. Because now we have a guy that Kenny can't beat. This is They're bringing the Okada feud to the United States. Because Kenny couldn't beat Okada. Until he finally did. I think it's super important to make stars. And Kenny Omega's already made. In this company, he's an EVP. He needs to be able to do more behind the scenes. Because obviously, they need to get a tight lip back there. They need to knock that shit off. All that random stuff that they do. So on screen, we're going to need other people to follow. And what... Better credibility to give to Keshida than to have him have two wins over Kenny Omega. I really was surprised, but pleasantly surprised with how much I enjoyed this match because I I don't know much about Takeshita. I really don't. The video package before told me a little bit, but it wasn't so much that I would jump 
over the moon and be like, oh, I'm a new Takeshita fan. But this match? Oh, no. This match told me one thing. When I sign off here tonight, I will be YouTubing Takeshita matches. I need to know more about this man. Thank you, Kenny Omega. Thank you, AEW, for introducing this man to me because I think he is he's bringing strong style back with his elbows, his forearms. I, I think in terms of believability, the guy's a monster. He looks great. And having a guy like John Callis, I, I feel like it's going to help further him and elevate him up the card. So we'll see what happens. All right. Now we have Spot Fest City. We have Bullet Club Gold, which consists of Jay White, Juice Robinson, and the Guns. Versus the Heart Foundation and Rocker's Light. Oh, I'm just kidding, guys. Calm down. I don't want people to get all angry that I'm making fun of uh, your favorite tag teams. But we have FTR and the Young Bucks. Uh, If this is your style of wrestling, then more power to you. I have... I don't know. I guess the old saying says, if you have nothing good to say, don't say anything at all. I thought this was spot fest after, like, that's all it was. It was spot after spot after spot. That's all they wanted to do. The camera angles kept panning out to see the the four the four person sharpshooter. Uh, we got to see one of the FTR and one of the Young Bucks hit the Shatter Machine together. We got to see one of the FTR, one of the Young Bucks hit a super kick together. Ultimately, I think it's leading to another FTR versus Young Bucks match. Hopefully, it's better than All In. But in terms of this show alone, I really thought it was unnecessary. And the Young Bucks caught a lot of heat in the beginning. But by the end, the fans were, they didn't want to boo. They they knew what they were watching. They were watching a really good AEW show. I didn't think it was super spotty or anything like that. This match was that indie-rific spot fest. Everything else was really solid. But you watch the show yourself and tell me what you think. All right, guys. Moving on to the main event of the evening. Listen. The main event of the evening was by far one of... I don't even know how to describe it. It was by far one of the most exceptional matches from start to finish. But before, before I get into it, I got to talk about this video package because this video package really sold a lot for me. John Moxley does his best to put over Orange Cassidy. He tells everyone he's considered a, a, a cosplayer, playing wrestler. Everybody says he's not the real deal. He does look like a real deal to me. That's pretty good, right? But what really stuck out to me is what Orange Cassidy said. Because both of these guys are really polarizing with the fan base. And Orange Cassidy says, when the company was down, when AEW was down, John Moxley carried it on his back. He lifted it up. And I thought, you know what? He, he's not wrong. But for some reason, people have just put John Moxley in this category that he's not a good professional wrestler. And I disagree, guys. I think he's exceptional. I think he's just doing what he loves to do, and he loves to get beat up with foreign objects. That's it. But if you ask the man to go out there and give us what he just gave us, he's going to do it. So now on to the main event of the evening. Freshly squeezed Orange Cassidy versus John Moxley, the wild thing. Oh, man. There's no doubt about it. We were very lucky to watch this match. I could not recommend the match more to to wrestling fans. Whether you're an indie fan or you're a WWE fan, this is a match for everyone. I was hooked from start to finish. I couldn't even write notes during the match. I went to the bathroom after the match was over on my way up here to fill up my drink. And, um, And I thought to myself, well, that sounded weird. Right? No, I went to the bathroom first, then filled up my drink. Sorry. <laughs> but I was thinking I got to write notes on this. So then I decided to like voice speak them into my phone. So I'm going to just tell you exactly what I wrote. You do not need a match. You do not need to win a match to prove that you're ready for the next level. 
This was the third match of the evening where we saw someone get made. Orange Cassidy was made. He is officially ready for the main event scene. Whether he gets put there or not, we don't know. Because this company tends to screw things up. But I thought to myself, this was like watching The Godfather for the first time. And no, of course not. I'm not saying it's as good as The Godfather. That would be ridiculous. What I'm saying is the first time you watch The Godfather, the first time you watch Inglorious Bastards, the first time you went to a museum, the first time you saw something that touched your soul, it was a, a, a type of art, right? And it meant something to you. I was so hooked. This was like going to a movie theater and refusing to check what time it was. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen. I thought, my God, we are watching an absolute magic fest right here. This was something I didn't know that these guys could do. You just heard me talk to you on here about what I think about John Moxley, so I knew that he could do it, but I didn't know Orange Cassidy could. I really didn't. He sold his ass off. He made me believe everything, and he got his ass kicked in this match, guys. I really, really think that in terms of professional wrestling, we have gotten to the point where we are hypercritical, and I really want people to just enjoy wrestling. Please do yourself a favor. Go back and watch Orange Cassidy versus John Moxley because I'm going to put it on the level of Adam Page and Kenny Omega versus the Bucks, Brian Danielson versus MJF, Kenny Omega versus Will Ospreay. It is that level good. And the best part about it is these two are just like behind the scenes top stars. They're not one of the most notable names. There's no MJF in this match. There's no Brian. There's no Punk. There's no Kenny. There's no Bucks. It is just John Moxley, bl- uh, break glass in case of emergency, and Orange Cassidy, a 15 to 20 minute guy who can give you a solid television match. But he is so ready for the main event because he just closed the show in Chicago the day after a controversy, and the crowd was on its feet. They they did not care that CM Punk was there because Orange Cassidy gave them everything they wanted, guys. It was beautiful. It was an art. Please go back and watch it. My overall thoughts on the show was I'm going to give it a four and a quarter empanadas because I really think that they saved all their good stuff for this week. I'm going to make a controversial statement here. All in was 100% an indie show in front of a jam-packed crowd, a 80,000-person jam-packed crowd. This felt like a professional wrestling show, and this felt like something WWE would have run. I don't know if maybe they decided they wanted to prove their worth. I don't know what the decision was or who who made the decisions to get us to this point. But I'm happy that they did. Because up until this show started, I thought to myself, this is going to be terrible. All right, guys. Let me move over to some of the questions in the comments. AEW's woke hot garbage. Whoa, that's a pretty harsh statement there. I mean, most of the time I would say, yeah, there, there's some garbage. There's definitely garbage wrestling, but not definitely not going to get political. <laughs> um, Cry babies from workers all the way to management. Well, that is true. The Young Bucks definitely are. And that video yesterday after Punk getting fired, that didn't help their, that didn't help their stock there. JJ has a crew. (laughs) I don't necessarily get that one. I'm sorry, Papa. 
Adam Cole is the man who could make it in the WWE main roster. Well, I don't think he was really given a chance. I think he he bet on himself. He decided, you know what? I'm going to go out there, and I'm not a manager. I'm going to go out there, and I'm actually going to work. And to be quite honest with you, I think he's the better one of the tag team. I think he's miles apart better than MJF, but obviously MJF has the look, so we're going to go with that. But I think he's a better talker than him, too. At least MJF is not a crybaby bitch like Jungle Boy. Well, I think Jungle Boy did what he did to get time off, and I don't think Punk liked it, but I'm sure we'll find out more information as it goes on. I keep waiting for the CM Punk statement, but let's see. AEW do not do PLEs. They're relegated to pay-per-view. Yeah, that's true. That is true. I like I like that I can say pay per view again without getting uh without feeling like I messed up. So I really enjoyed it though. I thought it was a really good show. Did anyone show their backs? Oh, that's a reference to Raquel Rodriguez. Uh, no, I don't believe they did. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, guys, do yourself a favor. Go back and watch AEW All Out. It was an exceptional show. I thought what. What a great time to be alive, to be a wrestling fan, to have two different companies just going at it with each other, trying their best. I think it was really interesting to do back-to-back pay-per-views, especially knowing what we know now, but no question, All Out was better than All In. I I don't even remember half the matches at All In. I do remember the Sting match. I remember Will Ospreay carrying Randy the Ram, and I remember how angry... I was at the sloppy finish of MJF Adam Cole and then not letting anything breathe. But as we know from WWE, they don't let shit breathe either. That's why main event Jay is back. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for tuning into the show. I appreciate all of you. And I'll be back with my raw review tomorrow night. All right, guys, I'm out.